I came here six years ago, exact, almost exactly six years ago. I still remember uh, you know, the Dennis and Andy you know, the, we had this seminar. And the, the topic back then was uh, trying to convince everyone to use GPUs. And um, you, know, the, you probably know that uh, David Kirk and I wrote the, uh, the uh, GPU programming textbook. And you know, so at that point, uh, we, we were at the point where just quite a few uh, supercomputers started to use GPUs. And um, uh, I was one of the co uh, in, uh, principal investigators for the uh, Blue Waters machine. And um, uh, right before I came to Stanford for the, uh, for the seminar, I went to NSF for a review and I was hammered by the review panel and they say that nobody will ever use GPUs for computing. And so today, I don't think I need to make that argument anymore. So I'm not gonna give that seminar, okay? So I'm gonna uh, you know, talk about a few things that we learned building practical AI systems and uh, applications and how we're developing the machine that we believe will be the right kind of machine for computational intelligence or some people call AI but I prefer to call, call this computational intelligence. So the, um, this work is done in uh, the IBM Illinois C3SR Center which is uh, started in 2016. You can just you know, use that link uh, to go to the center. And then uh, uh, it's really uh, set up to, to, uh, to create game-changing AI technology and systems. As Andy said so eloquently, you know, AI will be pervasive when it becomes really cheap, very reliable, and uh, you know, very accountable, right? So, um, so there's several dimensions that we're innovating, and I'm gonna walk you through this because a lot of these things that we experience led to some of the design decisions that we're making you know, for the Eridice system. The AI applications, we're focusing on you know, the video analytics and document analytics. And um, uh, so you know, we'll, we'll talk, I'll, I'll show you a couple examples. And AI task li uh, libraries. Stanford has been extremely successful with the natural language processing uh, you know, the primitives. And uh, you know, so that is one of the you know, big contributions to the natural language world. And we believe that uh, you know, we will need to have the next level of what we call the task libraries that uh, you know, would uh, further uh, you know, push the, um, uh, the state of the art. And then uh, you know, uh, we need to build platforms and tools. And um, uh, before we build any system, I always believe that we need to make sure that we know how to measure the system and we know how to you know, improve, you know, use the measurement to improve these systems. So I'm gonna show you ML model scope, which is the primary tool that we're using to evaluate uh, all the AI pipelines that we're, you know, we're building today. And then uh, the hardware, you know, uh, how do we create low cost storage class memory, uh, near memory acceleration. The technology is not quite there yet, but there are some really promising ones and we're prototyping with the flash technology today. And the part of the conversation that I had today with Sabashi's group is you know, exactly where we're going to be able to find the mass producible low cost storage memory you know, the uh, base technology and then near memory acceleration. The center is funded at uh, more than $20 million for five years and um, uh, the, we have you know, 14 faculty members and uh, 40 grad students. But more importantly, we actually have uh, over uh, 15 IBM staffs who are spending a lot of time working with us and helping us building prototypes and so on. In, in my opinion, that's the most valuable part of this, you know, the, the center. We, I personally learned a whole lot. I'll show you a couple of the, you know, what I mean by prototyping and so on, okay? So these are the core faculty member, and uh, core uh, faculty team. And uh, so Jin Jin is my co-director. And uh, if you look at uh, you know, the, the uh, list of faculties, we really span all the way from computer vision to natural language processing to data mining, all, uh, all the way down to you know, hardware, uh, you know, the synthesis even. So, so these are the, you know, so this is the team and uh, you know, they, it, it turned out to be extremely valuable when we you know, the, uh, you know, uh, build and evaluate uh, the systems applications. And so far, we have published uh, 56 uh, uh, papers out of the center. And this is actually something that, uh, you know, the, academically, um, you know, we have not been a, uh, able to produce you know, the, so many uh, major publications out of most of our centers. And the, so this also tells us how exciting the field is because you know, the, there are so many innovations going on. 
And then uh, you know, some of the papers are in the system category, uh, Boulder 2, and then uh, NIPS, you know, the, which is the machine, uh, AI general and machine learning, and ACL and so on, that's the natural language processing, and then the computer vision conferences and computational creativity conferences. ICCC is the computational creativity. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to uh, walk through, you know, nearly, I'll probably focus on only about, uh, you know, six of these paper kind of topic, you know, through the talk, but uh, you know, the, the, all these papers are available on the website. So when we de design a machine, there's one very important thing that I learned over the years. That is, never propose a machine without knowing what the machine is supposed to be, to, to be doing. So, uh, you know, it, for any student who want to design new machines, the first thing I, I said is, you know, to show me the application that you really want to, to, to be able to support. So, the, in this center, uh, you know, we, we have been looking at applications extremely carefully. So, the, I assume that many of you know about the Watson Jeopardy uh, challenge, right? In 2011, uh, you know, the uh, Watson, you know, the computer uh, you know, defeated the Jack Jenkins, who was the defending champion for Jeopardy, right? And um, so this was the pipeline that they used, uh, you know, in, in that contest. And um, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the software pipeline, um, you know, we start from the left-hand side, and um, uh, we have this, you know, input, you know, essentially question and um, uh, topic analysis. IBM actually cheated a little bit in that comp uh, com uh, competition because they didn't use verbal, uh, you know, the voice, uh, you know, the input. They actually used the, uh, you know, the, the special Jeopardy interface for, uh, you know, for, uh, for people who cannot hear. And so uh, there is a text, you know, input and out, uh, I interaction interface to accommodate disabilities for the contestants. So IBM used that interface. So there's no voice processing, no speech processing. And, um, uh, but even the text that come in, they have to do quite a bit of uh, what I call the estimation and constraint optimization and uh, word embedding. And uh, you know, today, in today's world, we will be using natural uh, neural net, but uh, during that particular time, they did not use neural net for that particular you know, the contest and the principal component analysis. So these are the things that you need to do in order to, to get a reasonably accurate uh, you know, the interpretation of that, what that question is asking. And many of you probably experienced this. You know, when you use something like Amazon Echo or, the, you know, something like, uh, you know, Google Home, and if you, you know, if you say things in a kind of a more con conversational way, these, you know, uh, these devices oftentimes get very confused because they don't have deeper analysis about what the question is about. They don't have these kind of you know, the, the analysis to, to actually try to figure out what the question really is or what the command really is. They're just looking for some keywords. So this is you know, one of the things that we, we experience a lot. You know, if you look at you know, a lot of these you know, applications, even though they're doing well, reasonably well today, but in order for them to improve to the next level, the difficulty and challenge can be really, really high. And then you need to have a huge amount of data you know, if you only want to use that approach you know, to, uh, to get that accuracy. And then uh, once you have the question and uh, you know, topic analysis, there are actually multiple ways you can interpret that question. So all these different interpretations will lead to different paths. So that's, those are the paths that we're listing in the bottom. And for each interpretation, uh, you're going to, uh, you, you use the interpretation of the question to search for the answers. And these search uh, uh, involve graph search, matching, index search, and content-based search. So it depends on the kind of information that you have. You will have these different modalities of search. And once you have you know, some of the candidate answers, um, they also have a, uh, you know, the, uh, the evidence you know, the path, which is you know, the, uh, down the, uh, in the kind of in the middle of that thick picture here. And this is to, you know, to validate your proposed answer with some of these evidence. And these evidence may not directly contribute to the, to the answer, but they provide co, you know, some kind of you know, the, uh, you know, correlation or some kind of you know, corroboration about you know, how these answers could be true. And then uh, you, know, you, you, you use that to, you know, to give an indication of how strong or how weak these evidence are 
for the, uh, for, the, for the answer. And eventually, you take all these different paths and you do a constraint optimization to minimize cost, risk, and uh, maximize the accuracy, and then you get an answer. All these things need to be done in less than three seconds. And that's the, the jeopardy, you know, the uh, latency. That is, uh, typically a contestant will be able to hit that button within three seconds. So if the computer takes more than three seconds, in, uh, you know, chances are that you know, the, the other side will win. So that, this was the hard constraint that they had to, you know, that, to deal with. So uh, they have a lot of these machine, you know, uh, machine learned models uh, in the final consideration for the, uh, as, you know, the, to, to run the constraint optimization. And back then, they uh, used you know, the models like uh, SVM models and K-nearest uh, neighbor kind of things. But today, if you look at a similar pipeline in the Watson you know, the structure today, many of them are neural net based now. And so you know, that, that's kind of a, you know, the, the, the pipeline structure that we're seeing again and again in, you know, in some of these, you know, the, I would say, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, AI applications. So um, you know, in 2017, we, uh, we worked with IBM to produce an uh, application which automatically generates sports highlights and analytics. <laughs> And then, uh, so uh, this is uh, mostly a, a, a neural net based approach with uh, you know, some of the uh, rankings based on the constraint optimization you know, the, uh, solutions. And um, so uh, you know, the, in 2017, you know, the IBM deployed the system for Wimbledon and generated the ranked uh, you know, the, uh, uh, highlights. So essentially for every uh, tennis game, it will detect the highlights or the excitement through the, uh, the motions and through the, uh, all the sound, that, you know, the, the, through the audio and the video to determine the beginning point and end point of exciting plays. And um, so that, you know, the, uh, sometimes you, you, know, you have to use both in order to be able to get accurate results because you know, the, you, you, uh, there may be a lot of plotting and so on, but uh, it may be after the play, right? Uh, so, so there are you know, you know, quite a bit of these kind of you know, data we, we actually had to use a lot of data to be able to, you know, to, to get a, a good detection of that. And um, uh, so one of the more recent applications that we, you know, we built uh, in the center uh, is an automatic conference reviewer assignment system. So in, in, our, in my field, um, you know, uh, I have been the uh, program chair for quite a few conferences. And one of the, the very, very hard problem to solve is that the program committee members are heavily overloaded. So, you know, the, it, it, it is, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, two days before the deadline for these reviews, you see that every, you know, every half an hour or so, the program committee member will enter another review. They say, okay, you know, the, <laughs> that's how much time the pers person was using for, you know, the, for, for you know, reviewing the paper. But then, so, uh, started uh, a, a few years ago, most of these program committees start to use external reviewers, right? Uh, they wanted to, you know, to spread out the work and uh, involve more experts so that uh, they can get better quality reviews. And uh, so one of the challenges is that uh, you know, you will, now you have you know, uh, hundreds of the reviewers, potential reviewers that you need to assign to these papers. And uh, you know, when I chair some of the program committees, you know, I have a very small uh, program, uh, subcommittee to, to do this kind of assignment. But we always wanted to be able to have a, you know, a, a more systematic tool to be able to do this. Toronto built a tool uh, you know, uh, um, a couple of years ago. The problem with that system is that uh, the potential reviewers need to go and enter the, you know, uh, uh, enter the uh, keywords of the, uh, the topic. So we said, okay, that's not very usable. You know, the, it's already hard to get people to agree to, you know, to, to uh, do a review. So what we ended up doing was we actually go, went and ingested the, all the previous papers from ISCA, HPCA, and Micro. So we're a few thousand papers and, uh, in the past you know, 20 years, uh, 30 years or so. And then, uh, you know, so uh, we used the abstract and also the author list of those papers and uh, did a, a topic analysis. So this is one of the, you know, the, uh, the data mining you know, the techniques. We use LSA you know, to generate the, uh, the topic vectors for these uh, papers. And then uh, we ingested uh, all the submitted papers 
uh, you know, uh, the abstracts and the uh, authors. Then uh, we, we generate the same you know, uh, uh, topic vectors. And then we uh, use these two, you know, we, we match up the topics uh, with the neural nets. And then uh, we did, did a conflict of interest matching. And uh, this actually turned out to be really, really problematic because the author names are not the most reliable way to disambiguate people. So the, the author names oftentimes get spelled differently, and then uh, they, they may belong in different uh, institutions. So even use the institution to try to, 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 uh, to disambiguate that is kind of challenging. So we had to build several AI tasks you know, to be able to do the disambiguation and so on. So that, uh, I'll kind of come back to that point later. And then eventually we, ro we run a big cons constraint optimization problem uh, the, the, so we need to have minimal number of reviewers per paper. We need to have uh, no more than a certain number of papers assigned to each reviewer. Uh, we need to you know, make sure that the program committee members, you know, are, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a certain number of program committee members assigned to the review. And then uh, we need to have the, uh, the reviewer ratings. You know, some of the conferences even have some previous you know, ratings uh, you know, by the fellow reviewers about the reviewer performance of this. So we, we put that all into this constraint solver, and then we give a proposed uh, you know, assignment. And uh, for ISCA this year, the program committee uh, accepted about 80%, uh, more than 80% of our proposed uh, you know, the, you know, the, uh, review. And then they say that you know, this particular, uh, these suggestions were you know, as good or even better than what they would have come up with because you know, there's certain things that uh, they, you know, they say, you know, they didn't even realize that some of, some of these people are particularly you know, interested or uh, expert in a particular topic. I'm not gonna go into this, this one, but uh, you know, uh, I'm going to you know, uh, go right into the uh, task libraries. So I already hinted this. In order to build these good AI applications, one of the most important factors is how many of these task libraries are available. If you have really, really high quality task libraries, you will be able to build novel, reliable AI applications. If you lack those, then everyone will be starting from scratch. And we all know that uh, you know, the, the software industry did not thrive because everyone started from scratch. You know, there are all these APIs today that, uh, that are critical for our existing software systems. So the, um, the task libraries that we ended up building uh, in the center are uh, you know, uh, mostly focused in, uh, you know, in three uh, areas. One is the image video analytics. And um, so uh, we, we built object detection, traction, and classification uh, you know, libraries. And then we built uh, text grounding libraries. And these are the libraries that uh, take the videos and generate the text description uh, you know, for that. And then the, uh, the content-based searching, you know, how do we you know, reliably uh, enable the, gen, uh, the extraction of feature vectors from the, uh, you know, from the uh, images and, uh, to be, so that we can do video level and image level content-based searching. But, uh, for the uh, document understanding part, uh, you know, we, uh, we had to build uh, temporal relations from scratch because we couldn't find any you know, the, uh, reasonable uh, library for uh, doing temporal relations. So when you parse a, you know, a piece of text, you know, which event happened before what, and uh, you know, which event happened at the same time, and so on. And that's also important in understanding the causal relations. So the, you know, the, that is also a very hard, you know, the, in, in, even to this day, I think we, we finally got some reasonable temp, uh, temporal relations you know, the capability, but we're still you know, struggling with some of the causal relations. And name entity disambiguation, topic modeling, semantic capacity, uh, some of the words have a lot more general meaning than others. So computer science is probably a more general word than, let's say, you know, operating system. So, so there, you know, essentially you need to have a, a method to create the ontology and rather than relying on your users to provide ontology, because user-provided ontology never, is never going to be maintainable, and so on. And then the semantic uh, the sentiment analysis. You know, the, or when the paper mentioned a particular piece of work, is the paper agreeing with that piece of work, where the paper is saying that that piece of work is incorrect, right? So, so that really you know, the, makes a lot of difference in terms of you know, how 
we we make conclusions out of you know uh, for for the work and then how we assign reviewers and so on right uh, into these uh, systems, and computational creativity. You know how do we quantify creativity? And um, uh, this piece of work actually started with Chip Watson at IBM, and um, uh, so uh, Chip Watson has a feature of you know creating what they call the creative dishes. And um, uh, so they actually have an underlying you know, the, uh, database about the molecular, uh, molecular level uh, you know, the, uh, contents of each ingredient. And then uh, they use that to, create the, to, you know, to predict the surprise or the kind of the, the new, newness of flavor that the, you know, the, uh, the, the person who's eating the food will be, be able to, you know, to, to experience. So uh, we started with that, and then you know, the, uh, started to formalize some of these things. And uh, uh, Lash, uh, Love Varshney, who used to be at IBM uh, in that uh, uh, Chef Watson team, is now on, on the faculty in Illinois, and he's now extending that into other aspects, such as the writing, such as the solution, you know, so the engineering solution, or the, uh, the even you know, some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the less obvious solutions to some problems. So the, for the Object detection and tracking, this is actually a fairly common uh, you know, AI task. There are many, uh, quite a few you know, the code available and the, uh, the models available. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it still uh, can be challenging when you have different lighting conditions, occlusions, and uh, you know, uh, uh, grouping, and then fast motion. So, so these are the kind of things that uh, you know, we started to understand that Sometimes you cannot just use one model, you know, that if you really want to have very, very reliable, you know, the, uh, tracking of these things, sometimes you need to have multiple models. So, so this is, uh, this begin to, you know, to lead into some of the, you know, the, the work that we're doing at the infrastructure level to be able to enable the fast switching and the fast uh, connection to different models under different conditions. And uh, we won the number one place in the uh, 2017 NVIDIA C uh, City Challenge, uh, you know, using uh, with this task, uh, you know, the, uh, this this piece of library. And then uh, person parsing, how do we, you know, uh, you know, systematically uh, decompose uh, the human, you know, the, into uh, different parts? Because this is foundational to to gesture, you know, understanding and uh, you know the uh, predicting of motion and so on. And uh, so so this. Uh, you know, the, this particular library also has you know, the, some uh, real challenges, especially you know, when you have you know, occlusion and multiple people involved. And uh, it's very, very easy to, for these things to, to be confused. So we won the number one place in uh, 2018 CVPR and, uh, uh, we, the, for the three tracks, single person, multiple person, and fine-grained uh, multi-person uh, you know, challenges. Um, graph. You know, the, so, Graph is one of those things that uh, you know the uh, traditional NLP use a lot, and the, the traditional NLP parsing uh, would uh, build graph structures out of the sentences and, and uh, paragraphs and so on. And uh, it turns out that uh, you know the, for serious processing of you know the, of documents and so on, we still need to use uh, graphs. So uh, we uh, you know so we we are built we built several graph analytics you know the uh, libraries. And uh, we participated in the, uh, the DARPA uh, Hive uh, HPEC uh, EC, uh, you know, the 18 challenge for triangle counting and trust decomposition with the GPU and FPGA library. So now, you know, with these applications and uh, libraries, uh, we, we started to see that uh, there's some, you know, serious, um, you know, I would say challenges running these applications cheaply, right, They're using Andy's term on the existing machines. And, uh, but before we, you know, the, we, we, we go out and, and, you know, make some of these, you know, the decisions, uh, we, we built, or first built a couple of tools and uh, light, uh, uh, platforms in order to be, uh, for us to be able to, you know, to, to actually you know, observe and improve, you know, some of the things and, um, you know, uh, guide our hardware design. So the first piece of tool we built was a ML model scope, and this is a a a, a, a tool that uh, allow us to be able to you know to uh, to measure uh, the effect of uh, uh, machine learned models on applica in uh, applications. So uh, this this is a open source framework, so you can find it online, and then uh, uh, it's uh, it's hardware and framework. Uh, 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 agnostic, so meaning that uh, it supports multiple 
of the frameworks and models is that it doesn't depend on particular <coughs> hardware either. And uh, it's extensible and customizable. So uh, you know, we, can, uh, we can also measure the, uh, you know, the, if, um, the performance of these machine learned models on, in uh, real applications. So uh, it allows the user to specify um, you know, uh, how the hardware and software stacks are provisioned and then the abstractions of the frameworks and profiling frameworks. We, uh, we, we actually coalesce quite a few profiling frameworks from different vendors in order to give us the view that we need. And then uh, for the output, we, you know, we, we can define the data consumption schemes so that we can uh, make reasonable uh, you know, uh, comparisons. So this is a sub uh, example uh, that uh, is mostly the architecture for the, uh, the sports highlight uh, you know, video uh, uh, generation. And these things are actually uh, you know, created mostly with distributed software infrastructure. And um, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of these you know, the, um, uh, functionalities are invoked with REST API. And you know, so, uh, you know, so you, uh, we, and also uh, most of these are created with uh, you know, the component, uh, uh, with uh, uh, container technology. So on the left hand side, I'm showing that uh, the, or the, the source code with the user functions and these user functions will invoke either uh, their own models or uh, they will uh, go to the uh, model category and say for IBM, for example, there's a machine learning as a service uh, you know, in the IBM cloud. So you can go through a live uh, catalog and then say, I want to have the scene understanding API. Okay, I want to invoke that API. And that gets, you know, at the wrong time, that uh, gets in, uh, tr translated into a, con uh, a uh, uh, container uh, with the software binary. And then uh, the, you know, the, when you execute the container, it's going to either invoke the function or it's going to go through the REST API and invoke some of the servers. You know, the, the, this is you know, the, uh, to be able to you know, invoke the, uh, the, the cloud service API. And so in order for us to, you know, to understand um, the performance implications of, the, uh, of these uh, neural net models, we need to be able to take a full latency of the entire process. Okay, so from the user's point of view, from beginning to end, when the request is made and until the, the answer comes out, you know, what are the components of the, uh, you know, of the latency? So, so this is the capability of the system, but I wanted to show you, you know, uh, what some of the typical usage of this kind of tool. So this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a real uh, case that uh, we use when we, uh, when Vota, NVIDIA Vota GPU came out, uh, you know, we wanted to understand you know, how the different frameworks are using that Volta GPU. Okay. So, uh, so here we show uh, four of the frameworks, TensorRT, uh, MXNet, CAFE2, and CAFE. And um, you know, it, it's very interesting that these, you know, uh, these frameworks end up with very, very different performance. Uh, for uh, for the Alex net perform uh, model, so you know some of them are you know much faster than the others, and then um, but with M ML model scope, what you can do is you can open up the convolution layer, for example, you can open up each section and see how that expands into the GPU execution details. How does that uh, you know, break down into the data copying cost? How does that break down into the kernel execution cost and um, uh, tensor RT? Some of the tensor RT, you know, the library cost. So, so the, you know, the, I'm sh showing you at the bottom, you know, all these different components and uh, what are the library functions. And you can even tell if you know a particular framework is using the NVIDIA library or is using its homegrown library. How effective its homegrown library is, and so on with uh, you know, with this kind of measurement. So in practice, you know, um, it's actually uh, very interesting that uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the generations of uh, hardware, for example, uh, people would imagine that the Volta GPU being you know, the much uh, faster in terms of computation and even uh, somewhat faster in memory bandwidth, the Volta uh, you know, the GPUs should be faster than the Pascal GPUs. But there's one factor, the important factor, that is, you know, x86 does not have NVLink between the host and the GPU. Whereas the IBM, you know, the uh, power machines have NVLink between the, uh, the uh, G CPU and the GPU. So even though the uh, IBM power machine, uh, power 8 machine use 
uh, Pascal GPU, which is a you know, slower generation, but because of the MV link, uh, the overall uh, inference is actually faster, lower la total latency compared to an x86 machine using a VOTA. And this is because you know, the, uh, you know, the, the fully connected layer is the layer with the most weight, right? Uh, if you, 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 the convolution layers have much fewer weights than the fully connected layers. So, so that's why, you know, in this particular inference, the fully connected layer is much more important than the, uh, the, the rest, and so you, you ended up with less performance. So this uh, particular you know, the, um, tool is not one of the three recommended harnesses for MLPERP, so you can actually go and get the tool and then you use that for your own studies. Quite a few people are using that uh, for you know, the, uh, you know, scrutinizing their uh, models. So one of the interesting things we learned about latency, so the, you know, Andy mentioned this latency, and um, you know, latency is one of those things that are you know, really, really hard uh, to, to get rid of. So, you know, so here is a, uh, you know, we, we, we run a, a set of exp uh, an experiment with um, all the, uh, you know, quite a few models on the left hand side. And then uh, the different, you know, the, uh, uh, different frameworks, MXNet, CAFE, and uh, CAFE2, and, uh, and TensorFlow on the horizontal side with and without GPUs. So um, you know the, the, these. Then we you know we measure the total latency. So these are the uh, you know, and then we, we assign the percentage portion of latency to each cost. The main the three main costs of latency are the model loading, how you you know you when when the inference request comes in, that you need to load up the model weights okay into the uh, in, into your GPU. And then uh, you, uh, you have the input, you know, the processing. These are the scaling, you know, the scale of image sizes and, and you know, some of the pre-processing and generating the, the right vector you know, into the models. And then the, uh, the, the compute part, which is the, you know, the neural net itself. And so you know, right away you see that a lot of the frameworks, a lot of the frameworks, the latency is actually dominated by model loading. It's not dominated by the, uh, the neural net uh, you know, uh, evaluation. So if you try to <coughs> use uh, the TPUs and uh, you know, the special hardware to accelerate the, uh, the neural net evaluation, you're not going to get much benefit out of that. So this is the kind of uh, visibility that we, you know, we, we really wanted to have for all the applications so that, that we can make the right kind of hardware you know, decisions. So immediately out of this picture, we decided to build a new um, you know, uh, model serving infrastructure called TRIMS. And um, uh, so this uh, model serving infrastructure persists the model weights, the popular model weights in the, inside the, uh, the main memory. So when the new application comes in, uh, this infrastructure you know, when it, uh, uses the GPU, the NVIDIA CUDA IPC capability to just attach the weight to the new application so that you don't need to load anything. And it's, it, it, it has a, a, a couple milliseconds of latency, but it does not have, you know, the, it's way smaller, faster than you know, loading the uh, model from the storage and so, uh, and so on. So this cuts out uh, most of the latency. So the, if, you, if you look through the, you know, the models and uh, you know, frameworks and on different machines, you see that uh, you know, the, the, the latency actually gets dramatically improved. And after using this kind of you know, the, uh, model serving infrastructure, now the neural net evaluation is the primary uh, you know, uh, source of latency. And that's where the real acceleration will start to pay off. Right? So, so you know, this is the reason why you know, we, you know, uh, once we have the software set up about right, then we start to look at a few things that uh, we want to build in the hardware. So, uh, so this is really the beginning of you know, the, uh, the, uh, the erudite, uh, you know, the, uh, sort of the, the design rationale for erudite. So uh, if I look at the hardware for Watson Jeopardy uh, 2011, um, this was the description that you can actually go back to the 2012 article and then you see you know, this is uh, what IBM listed. Uh, they have 90 servers and um, uh, you know, uh, 500 gigabyte uh, per second on-chip bandwidth, and then uh, you know, uh, 15 terabytes of memory and 20 terabytes of disk clustered, and so on. And uh, uh, so it can deliver up to 80 teraflops. 
If we compare that with what we currently have, 80 teraflops is piece of cake today. Okay, it's you know each uh, Volta GPU gives you 14 you know terabytes of single precision, right? So you know that that for neural net that's you know so you. you Six of those, you know, that take care of the, 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 you know, five, six of those take care of the problem. And um, so, you know, we can easily get that kind of compute, uh, you know, uh, uh, throughput. However, the uh, amount of memory that, uh, that, uh, that they needed to have and, you know, the, uh, the bandwidth that they have, you know, in that machine is still a lot more than what we currently have. So, when we designed uh, the Aerodyne machine, uh, we wanted to specifically address uh, you know, several uh, challenges. One is, you know, how do we provide storage class memory? We want to be able to have these important models and important you know, vectors. You know, remember, we're not, for effective inference, we're not just using model weights. You know, remember those evidence, okay, those evidence kind of things and you know, the, the, the answer. You know, those are you know, all vectors that need to be accessed with very low latency, right? So preloaded into these you know, machines. So the storage class memory, you know, we would like to have somewhere around 10 terabytes of memory capacity so that we can essentially have, you know, a, for, a, for a, uh, you know, a Jeopardy kind of you know, contest, we would like to be able to have a college level knowledge, okay? And the uh, uh, skill set so that uh, you know uh, they can answer these questions as a college graduate. Okay, so uh, so uh, that's the flash, uh, a flat flash work that uh, is coming out of uh, S plus, uh, you know, uh, in April, and uh, we want to be able to persist these you know data objects so that they can have near uh, zero latency in the uh, in the data recall, so that uh, we can eliminate file system and language level uh, deserialization latency. And um, so basically, uh, you know, we have been rewriting some of the file system interfaces and programming language interfaces so that uh, we can, you know, easily connect these persistent objects into the application rather than going through the serialization process. And that's actually quite uh, uh, you know, significant our work. And that was the TRIMS project that's coming out of one of the ML system conferences. And the network acceleration, uh, you know, that we, uh, we, for training, uh, you know, we have an inception work that uh, does the, uh, you know, uh, uh, compression and decompression in the network interface so that uh, we can speed up the training process. And then for near memory acceleration, um, we just published the memory channel network. And then uh, uh, we, uh, we, we are starting to do the deep store work. And I'm going to actually show you a little bit of, you know, the, how that works. And then the, uh, for communication and co uh, collaborative execution, um, we need to have a way to characterize for any given system, we need to have a very accurate characterization of all the communication paths. And this is actually one thing that we don't teach very well in computer architecture. In modern you know, the, uh, computers, there are actually you know, very large number of paths in the uh, communication paths for data movement. So, you know, the, uh, and so the software drivers and so on use some of the paths, not necessarily its other paths. So we need to be able to, you know, to accurately detect which path is being used by which driver and so on so that we can have a uh, you know, reliable way of managing that data movement. Okay, so that's our calm scope, uh, you know, infrastructure. So let's start with the, you know, the, uh, the flat flash. By the way, if you have a question, you know, the, feel free to ask right away. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I realize that we're being recorded, so I, I will repeat the question if you ask you know, before the end. And so uh, how do we you know, the provide a storage class memory today? Um, when I look around and you know, say, you know, if I need to build a 10 terabyte uh, you know, main memory system today, what would be a reasonable cost? You know, technology I can use so that uh, it doesn't break the bank. You know, even though we have you know, uh, you know, $20 million of funding, most of the funding is for grad student support and so on, right? So we're not you know, burning all the money building one prototype machine. So we ended up uh, taking the, uh, the SSD, the, uh, you know, the flash technology. Today, if you have a large SSD drive uh, in your system, you can you know, produce kind of a large memory machine by memory mapping, okay, through the nmap, uh, you know, the you know, uh, interface. The problem is, even if you map, you, you did an nmap, 
you will still have page faults. Okay, you, when you access the data that is, you know, the, you know the, that's still in the SSD, you still need to use the page fault to be able to bring that data into your main memory, and that caused two uh, important problems. One is cost, software cost overhead. Of course, we all know that, right? The page translation and, and so on. So that's one. But the, 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 the more subtle thing is when you have a lot of page faults, the page faults are handled sequ sequentially. They're serialized. So there's not a lot of parallelism when you try to bring data into the, you know, in, in, into the memory. And that's actually, in, in real systems, that's actually a very, very significant problem. So what we did first is that we changed the host bridge and um, uh, we, uh, so that we uh, enabled a direct access path into the SSD. So that um, you know, the, um, the CPU doesn't have to go through the page fault, and uh, CPU can access either the SSD or the DRAM. So that um, you know, if the data is not reused often, we just let the CPU grab that data directly from SSD. And that also allows us to reduce what we call the, 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 uh, the data magnification problem. Because if you always have to bring these pages into the um, DRAM, you know, if you are using only a small portion of each page in your access, such as the graph applications, you, you would magnify the, the amount of data you need to transfer, right? So, so uh, that solves that problem. But then uh, you know, there are certain things that will be used often. For example, uh, when we are using the weights, the, the model weights, they tend to be accessed quite a bit. You know, so we want to be able to just you know, uh, move them into DRAM and uh, also through the caching system. So that's why you know, uh, we, we have a promotion process, and that requires hardware change. Yes? When you access the, the cache directly, where do you put what you retrieve? Uh, uh, so the question is, when you access cache directly. The flat flag. Yes. So uh, you know, the, uh, let me, uh, uh, I need to clarify this. <laughs> so when you say access cache directly. When you access the flat flag. Yes. Uh, okay, so when you access the SSD directly, so the, the data actually comes back into the, ca into the CPU cache. Okay. It doesn't come, so it, it comes back in the cache granularity. Okay. Yes. What is the penalty of accessing flash drives in uh, cache like sizes versus page size? Uh, say that again. What is the penalty when you access it in cache like versus page? Okay. So uh, what's the penalty of you know, accessing the cache line size versus the page size? So uh, th this, is, uh, this goes into the implementation. So uh, SSD, if you look at the, uh, the SSD devices, they're still fundamentally a page you know, uh, uh, infrastructure. So what we did was we took away the, uh, the, uh, the flash translation layer and use the G CPU to do the translation. We still do the, uh, the, uh, the wear leveling, but we do it through the, uh, the CPU you know, uh, virtual memory. So we, we actually have it, you know, change the Linux to be able to support this. So now we free up the DRAM in the flash translation layer. So if you truly have only one, you know, uh, one cache line used in a whole page, the cost is that we still transfer the entire page into the flash translation layer DRAM. It's just that it doesn't go through the PCIe and uh, it doesn't pollute the, uh, the, DRAM, uh, the system DRAM system. But still, it, it does have that uh, 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 late total latency. So if you use the entire page, that's great, right? Because once that's in, the D, in that SSD DRAM, then you can, you can just pump them out very, very quickly. Yeah, so th this is a, 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 a this does not go through the driver side. It actually do, you uh, go through the memory mapped I/O, uh, you know, of the PCIe. So it's transferred as a PCIe packet. Okay. Yes, Mark. But are you saying that in the SSD device itself, you're still doing a block transfer? You're just block transferring it into a DRAM that's local to the SSD. Device? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's the current generation. And we actually uh, have a second generation using the open SSD interface. And that open SSD interface allows us to do things uh, you know, uh, uh, with lower uh, granularity and also more parallelism. Yeah, but you can't make the granularity too much lower. Exactly. There's a tremendous amount of error correction and other things that requires very large... For the, 
for, for Flash. Exactly. So that's the reason why, you know, the, the, when, when I was talking to the, the, the Subashi group uh, today, you know, there's certain things I learned about, the, you know, that work, and I, I, I really feel that uh, that, you know, eventually that will be a very interesting path, right, uh, for the, uh, the RM technology. So today, you know, you're right. You know, there, the granularity cannot go too much uh, uh, lower in, you know, uh, in, into the, uh, if, if you're always going to only touch one, you know, uh, cache line, you still have penalty. It's better than what you're experiencing today with a map, but it's still going to be slow, okay? It's maybe two, three times better. So, um, so the, you know, the, this is the architecture, you know, that uh, we, we have a promotion look aside buffer that we prototype with a, a FPGA. And then uh, you know we uh, we did the uh, you know the, so that uh, the SSD uh, cache management and the promotion manager uh, in the uh, SSD CPU, and so for graph computation you know the, so this is the uh, you know the page rank and kinetic component analysis for the uh, you know the, for, for for the graph anal uh, analytics, and you know so uh, if we look the uh, the speed up that we have here is. You know, the, basically the speed up over the traditional software stack, and as the uh, the, the number of uh, the amount of SSD relative to the DRAM size grows, our benefit gets uh, grows. Okay, so so this is you know the what, this is the, the reason is um, you know as the SSD size grows, and uh, you essentially you will begin to you know, to trash the DRAM as you you know if you always bring the data into that DRAM. So that's the capacity. So the, you know, the, uh, we, we're now pretty confident that we can build a uh, reasonably large, you know, the, somewhere around uh, you know, one to 10 terabyte of memory with reasonable cost in a single, you know, the, in a single machine. However, you know, bandwidth at some point becomes you know, the, the important because you don't want to build a 10 terabyte machine with very, very limited bandwidth, which is 16 gigabyte you know, access or 32 gigabyte access through the PCIe, right? So uh, there needs to be some you know, better treatment. So you know, let me walk through a few slides to, you know, to make sure that uh, we're on the uh, same page. So you know, uh, here is a very simple, uh, simplified view of the uh, IBM Power 9 neural system with NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA Volta G GPUs. Um, it's structured as a two socket CPU, you know, the machine, and each socket connects to two of the voltage GPUs. And uh, so I'm looking at one of the, you know, one of the socket, okay. So uh, the, the CPU host, you know, can, uh, can process the data at about one teraflops, and then it has 80 gigabytes of, you know, the NVLink connection to uh, each of the uh, GPUs. And you know, as we saw in one of the previous uh, slides, you know, this is the reason why uh, the, the IBM Power 8 machine with Pascal GPU can actually outperform an x86 machine with a uh, Volta in some of these you know, the inferences because of the, uh, the data transfer bandwidth. Now, uh, for a typical x86 machine, that is about 16 gigabyte per second today. Uh, this is the PCIe 3. Okay, generation. So the for the uh, so then uh, the GPUs, uh, you know, the two GPUs also connect to each other with eight gigabytes per second, and the GPUs have HBM two, and uh, which has nine hundred gigabytes per second bandwidth, and this is very very important for the GPU performance. If you know uh, using that that HBM successfully is critical for uh, a lot of the training and inference uh, applications. So. Uh, if you ever run out of uh, you know, uh, memory in the HBM, which is 16 gigabyte, uh, which is also capacity-wise, it's 16 gigabyte. Okay, then you will need to be able to uh, to get your data from the DDR memory, which is on the other side of the CPU, through the 80 gigabyte uh, per second uh, mem uh, you know, the memory uh, 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 interconnect uh, MV link, or if you further run out of uh, you know space in the system DDR, in the Power A machine, it's half a terabyte, 
Okay, it's, uh, the machines that we have is half ter terabyte. If you need to have one or two or uh, so on terabyte, you need to go to the SSD. The SSD is about 10 terabytes, and the, that access bandwidth is 16 gigabyte per second. So let's do a little bit of an exercise. Let's say, in the best case, we use our HBM2, uh, which is you know, 16 gigabyte capacity, and uh, the access bandwidth is 900 gigabyte per second. Sounds great. Um, but you know, if we want to be able to achieve peak Volta compute the, uh, throughput, which is 14 ter single precision teraflops, we will need to, every operand that we fetch from the HBM into the GPU, we need to reuse that data 62.3 times to be able to, you know, to, to sustain the compute. Otherwise, we will be limited by that, that HBM bandwidth. And uh, so, or if we don't have data reuse, that's the other extreme. If we cannot reuse the data at all, every time we need to just, you know, we fetch one data, we, we process it, we cannot reuse it, then we can only achieve less than 1.6% of that peak. And we do have quite a few applications that have that problem. In fact, we measure these things all the time and we see quite a few of those. So let me give you one example. Uh, for an iterative constrained uh, you know, sparse matrix solver, uh, you know, uh, we actually don't have more than two times our data reuse. So it's kind of you know, in between, but it's very close to the uh, non-reusable part. And this one, essentially, you know, uh, we will be uh, sustaining about 100 gigaflops rather than the 1.4 teraflop you know, peak. Okay, so for this particular application, you know, we're uh, looking at right around, you know, less than, uh, you know, I would say 7% or so, okay, of the, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the peak. So, uh, you know, once, if we need to access data from the host memory, which is actually very, very common for most of our real applications today, we actually need to pull a lot of the data from the host, even the TRIMS server, actually you know, uh, has a lot of data in the host memory that we pull, pull into the GPU on a need basis because a lot of the bigger uh, you know, uh, models are almost use up the entire GPU, so we cannot afford to put all the data in the GPU memory, uh, all the weights in the GPU memory and just attach. We actually need to pull quite a bit of that from the CPU memory, and that's going through the 80 gigabyte per second. And whenever you pull anything across that interface, you better use the operand 700 times so that the GPUs can, you know, can, can uh, get, uh, get to the peak. Or if you don't reuse the data, you will fall down to 0.14%. So in many ways, you know, people will tell you, if you have very large data applications, if this is the dilemma of GPU computing today. If you have very, very large data processing, that's where you, you can really benefit from a high compute throughput device. But then you suffer from that, that data movement bandwidth limitation. So GPUs are actually over-designed computing device for many, many applications today. Okay. And you know, so th th this is something that you know, we all know, but uh, you know, it's actually very, you know, I would say when it hits you, when you look at some of the application performance data and they say, oh yeah, yeah I know that, but it still hurts, right? So, you know, so if we run an iterative solver uh, you know, from the CPU memory and just pull the data from the CPU memory into the GPU through a uh, you know, unified memory interface, uh, we can sustain no more than 10 uh, you know, gigaflops. And 10 gigaflops is actually a very slow embedded CPU today, okay? So this is how, you know, how the, the sort of the system balance is not quite right in many applications today. And then if you need to, uh, you know, pull the data from the flash, then you need to reuse the data 3,500 times, and we are sustaining less than one gigaflops. And you said, okay, you know, these are interesting things, and what do you see in practice? So in our triangle counting, you know, code, when we uh, you know, uh, participated in the DARPA challenge, you know, I'm not going to go through all the calculation with you, but uh, you know, I, I listed all the steps so that you can actually go through it. So basically, we get a, at an application level, we get a throughput of edges processed per second. Okay? 
And uh, so, you know, the, so if we take that number and go through the calculation of, you know, roughly how many edges are there for each, you know, the, the triangle counting means that you take each edge and then you'd see if there are two other edges that, you know, that connect from these two points and they overlap, right? And that gives you a triangle. So if you do the whole thing, you will realize that, uh, you know, we are actually uh, 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 processing about, you know, 13.6, you know, the uh, gigabyte per second uh, to the edgeless elements. Okay, and that you know the uh, essentially is tells us that we're limited by the memory bandwidth. We're nowhere close to what the GPU is capable of doing in the uh, in the in the compute throughput. <laughs> so that leads us to you know a practical method. We need to have a practical method for the GPU or CPU to tell the mem the, the the processing units in the uh, memory uh, near the memory interface, so that we can have you know the compute to be not limited by the memory channels, right? We need to have the compute on the other side of the memory channel. And there's another problem that we need to solve, which is how do we get enough bandwidth out of the, the SSD side? So, but that's not what's being solved in this particular work. This work is just how can we enable the CPU and GPU to tell those you know, compute to, uh, to do the work. Turns out that you know, there is actually a very real problem that uh, you know, if the software needs to be rewritten, there's still not going to be enough traction for this new hardware. So we, you know, in collaboration with IBM, we build a memory channel network. Essentially, we make all these devices look like Ethernet devices in the system, so that the CPU or GPU can just communicate with them as if they are separate you know, computers. And the fact that they're in the same box, you know, actually on the same board even. It allows us to, you know, to drastically reduce the overhead of Ethernet protocol. <laughs> so that, that basically, the, you know, we're no longer transferring data where the, you know, sometimes we can just, the, the, uh, the, the data is in the host, but it also is in the device because the device is part of the memory space, right? And so we can play these kind of tricks to drastically reduce the communication protocol and data movement overhead you know, for getting these devices to do the work, but it's transparent because you can use Spark to, uh, so we actually run Spark on top of this, you know, this network and it works. So, so that's the, you know, the, that's an existing approach and we, uh, we have, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, much more, uh, you know, I would say uh, aggressive approaches, but this is the baseline that we're going to use for, you know, processing the, you know, the, uh, uh, processing the, the graphs and so on, and uh, you know, uh, in the first generation. And this is prototyped. So we actually, uh, with the help from IBM, we prototyped the MCN on the Contuto board, which is buffer dim. So the IBM servers use buffer dim to allow them to have much bigger uh, main memory than the, uh, the, uh, you know, the sort of the commodity servers. And then the buffer dim board called Contuto also has enough FPGA space on it so we actually in implemented the protocols on the embedded processor on that board and the, you know, some of the processing in the FPGA so that uh, you know, we, we prototyped that board and, and do, did a demo of the, the functionality. So you know, uh, the communication overhead is so much lower that uh, even if you, you, know, you use a very small, weak you know, embedded processor on that Contuto board, we can still get significant band, uh, you know, speed up over using a separate server across the network, you know, in the in the cluster environment. So that, that this shows that we have about two times performance, in, you know, advantage over those kind of uh, you know servers. So moving forward, uh, you know, so let's kind of just you know conceptualize these things a little bit. You know, I, I'm showing you quite a few pieces, but I wanted to come back. And then put you know put things back and say you know these are the things that we're trying to accomplish. Number one, we want to remove the file system from access paths to very large data, right? We want we don't want to see file system anymore. And even if the application wants to see the file system, we're going to implement the file system in such a way that they just directly connect to the you know to, to the uh, persistent object. So we get rid of the storage. And then we put the storage into the uh, memory system, and that gives uh, about uh, 10 terabytes of storage. And so that 
we have two benefits. One is no more file system overhead as serialization, deserialization overhead. And the other one is now we can access the data more about 100 gigabyte per second rather than 16 gigabyte per second, right? So that's the first step. And uh, you know, there are a series of papers that led to the, you know, the, the capability. And then we want to be able to put about 100 uh, gigaflops uh, uh, you know, uh, computing capability into the, uh, you know, uh, into the uh, memory control channels so that we can actually have compute throughput that is proportional to the data capacity and then uh, bypass the memory channel limitation. So uh, this was the uh, IEEE Micro 2017 and we currently were prototyping this particular use case for that compute. This is called Deep Store, and um, it's an in storage acceleration for intelligent uh, image search. And um, so, conceptually, image search is fairly simple. Okay? Um, you have an offline phase that processes all the images that you have in your system. And then you index them somehow, you generate some kind of vector so that you can do the search. And then you have the online phase, which is on, underneath. When the new image comes in, you calculate the features and the vectors so that you, you do the search. And this is actually how you know, the Google and uh, Facebook and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Instagram you know, is doing the, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, the, the fast image search uh, in software today. And then, so we prototype this by calculating the, uh, the feature of, uh, you know, uh, vectors, it turns out that each image actually has multiple features because depending on the search, depending on the applications, uh, they actually need to have different kinds of feature vectors. So this goes back to you know, my previous comment that um, you know, the, um, not a single model or a single way of generating vectors will be able to satisfy many applications. The different applications, or even different scenarios of the same application, may require different, you know, vectors and different uh, uh, model weights. So then, uh, you know, so when the uh, the applications come in, we do the query, and then uh, you know we, uh, we we do the search. So uh, you know, so this is uh, one of the uh, the uh, the uh, cases that we prototyped uh, with the FPGA board, uh, you know, uh, on a memory channel. So uh, we do a, you know, essentially this is a person, you know, the, uh, a person that may be in different angles, and then you, know, you, you go and search for the same person in the system, you know, the, in, uh, in different positions. So the, what we stored in the system is a side view, and then, uh, you know, the, and then uh, we have a back view of the person, and we're trying to identify whether that person is there. And this is very common in, uh, you know, video surveillance. Uh, basically, you have multiple traffic video videos and so on. You're trying to see if you can find that same person, right, in your you know in your stored videos. So that that's actually how some of the the, the movie you know some of these movie scenes are about you know how they find the same person in different traffic videos. You know, this is the kind of things that they're supposed to be using. So, so this, you know, then the, uh, the, the two vectors go into the, uh, a, a, a fairly shallow neural net to be able to find uh, you know, the uh, similarity and so on. So, so that's you know, uh, what we hope to demonstrate uh, with that uh, prototype and um, uh, so that we can uh, publish the uh, initial usage result of the, uh, of the near memory acceleration capability uh, of Erudite. So in summary, you know, the, we have, you know, the, the Erudite is a, uh, you know, a project that uh, is driven by high potential AI applications. We feel that uh, you know, we, we, now we have you know, good understanding of some of the AI applications. We're still trying to understand more about the, uh, you know, uh, these other high-valued AI applications. And it's supported by instrumentation analysis tools. You know, we, you know, it took us a long time to build some of these tools. But once we have these tools, we, we know what's going on, and we can, you know, that, uh, we can properly identify you know, the, the real opportunities. And the good old Andos law, you know, still, you know, Andos law and the good old you know, the, uh, percentage of time and so on, they're all, they're all still true, okay? It doesn't mean that when AI becomes you know, popular, all those old laws go out of the window. They are still there. They're well, they're, they're, well, they're healthy, and they're going to, they're going to come right smack at you, you know, if you ignore them, right? 
And then uh, design is designed with modern software interfaces in mind. So you know we you know we, we specifically design our tools and environments to be able to handle the most modern you know cloud software deployment infrastructures and so on that uh, we can be dealing with uh, reality. Um, we removed the, uh, the file system bottlenecks and the serialization bottlenecks from the access path to large data sets. And then we increase the memory parallelism in accessing large data sets. This is actually one of the, in my opinion, um, the most critical breakthrough that computer architecture really needs to have in the next couple of years. Our ability to access large data set with high bandwidth is very much lacking. Okay. And the only way practical way is to spread the data into multiple nodes in a you know in a, a in a data center cluster however that in itself incurs the cost of, of data movement to start with right and placing compute into the appropriate levels of the memory system hierarchy um, we we are pretty confident that we can build machines where the acceleration happens on the other end of the memory channel However, there are opportunities if we can uh, tap into the, you know, the, uh, the hierarchical uh, organization of the non-volatile memory, you know, because these memories are all consists of banks and you know, the, the different you know, the, uh, chips and so on. There are actually a very large number of entities inside the each memory channel. And currently, we're not tapping effectively into the parallelism. And, but that would re require some significant change even to the SSD you know, uh, uh, vendors uh, the ability to expose these things. So we have been working with uh, two of the vendors trying to, you know, to get that interface uh, you know, available to us so that we can you know, uh, begin to, you know, to show uh, benefit. And then the data access bandwidth pro, uh, is proportional to the data capacity. And uh, this is something that uh, you know, we, we see in the, in the history again and again, that uh, the servers you know, who, that violate this principle actually you know, that don't get used very often. So that, this, this is the, the, the primary uh, you know, weakness of most of the large data servers today. And uh, collaborative near memory acceleration with CPU and GPUs. How easy it is for a CPU to say, you know, let's process all these things and then give me the answers or, or, or send me the data into my cache. Or for the GPUs to say, well, uh, you know, uh, rather than fetching that into, you know, into my, my uh, ARM chip, I want you to do some pre-processing and then only forward the, uh, the data into my uh, ARM chip uh, second level cache. So we currently include that there's no way to do this today. Okay, but you know we are prototyping you know the, with Nvidia a uh, driver that will allow us to be able to do this, which is, for those of you who, who are familiar with GPU programming, um, on the inside the GPU there is a mechanism called dynamic parallelism, and uh, you can launch kernel within the uh, GPU kernel. So we want to be able to extend that capability to launch kernel into the memory, right? So so that is you know the part of you know what we're trying to do beyond the memory channel network. Memory channel network is the ability to run a Spark application you know, without change right? In, inside these you know, memory processing devices. So we're hoping you know, with all these you know, th things added together, and we're already beginning to see you know, somewhere around you know, the, uh, not quite 100 times the improvement yet, but, um, uh, you know, for, uh, but we're beginning to see somewhere around 20 to 30 times the improvement. But with the right kind of interfaces you know, in the future, we were shooting for greater than 100 times the improvement. With that, uh, you know, we hope to be able to, you know, to have robust, high uh, the efficiency, you know, the efficacy cognitive computing applications. We want to make sure that you know, people are not, will not just try to use one neural network to, you know, to get some answers. They should feel free to run multiple neural networks and use constraint solvers to be able to minimize the cost in any way they feel, you know, that they, they see fit so that they can get much more robust solutions. And I think, you know, that would be critical for self-driving cars, for, you know, good, you know, the, uh, you know uh, personal assistance for good robotics and, uh, you know, many other things. So with that, 
thank you for your attention, and uh, you know, I'd love to answer any more questions. Okay. Thank you.